It's been a while since we posted the last episode in this series, but I think it's about time we get back to it. We'll start this off by installing something I had wanted even before buying the truck. This is a suspension lift kit. Specifically, the kit we ended up with was a Rough Country 4 and 3 quarter inch lift that's actually a combination body and suspension lift. I wasn't sure about installing the body lift at the time, but the way things worked out it only cost 40 bucks more to add on that half of the kit and I could certainly install the suspension lift without using it. We ended up getting the entire kit for just a little over $500, which to be clear I still think is a lot of money. But as far as lifting a truck goes, that's pretty far on the cheap side. As the truck currently sits, it actually already has Rough Country parts installed in the form of a 2 or so inch leveling kit on the front of the truck. These are pretty inexpensive, I think I paid less than 50 bucks for them back when we installed them somewhere in the middle of 2014. These are just nylon fiber spacers that sit between the struts and the control arms to lift the front of the truck up just a little bit. The idea is to get a little bit more tire clearance as well as raise the front of the truck up so that it more closely matches the empty ride height of the rear. These kits are cheap, simple to install, I like the look, and I never had any problems with it. Around the same time we installed that leveling kit, we switched to these 17 inch Mickey Thompson Classic wheels and Super Swamper IROC ND 33 inch tires. The outer diameter of the tire is actually pretty similar to the ones that came off of it, but the change to a much more negative offset pushed the tires farther out than they originally were, which meant that when they were turned there was a lot of rubbing. I ended up cutting a fair amount of plastic off of the front end fascia which helped a whole lot with this, but at the extremes of travel and especially with the truck loaded up they would rub pretty bad. One way to get more front end clearance at the rear of the fender well is what's called a NorCal mod. Basically you cut and fold back some of the sheet steel at the rear of the front fender wells, which gives just a little bit of extra space for tire setups like we have. As you can see here, even with no weight in the front of the truck other than the driver, the tires rub on the front and the rear of the fender well. When cutting the fascia and the inner fender, I went as far as I could possibly go without relocating the windshield washer reservoir. So in order to eliminate all of the rubbing, I would have to move the windshield washer reservoir, make some sort of modification to that front corner on the inner fender, and do a little bit of mangling to the sheet steel at the rear of the wheel well. I really didn't want to do all of that, and I always wanted to install a lift kit anyway, so I basically just ended up waiting. For a few years there, I ended up ignoring the tire rubbing, and whenever I had to do any tight maneuvers in a parking lot, I would kind of just duck my head down because people would definitely look over at the noise. That was until March of 2019 when I finally got the opportunity to buy one of these kits and get the best deal on it that I think I could reasonably expect. And that's what we're here to do in this video. We will be installing the suspension lift part of this combination lift kit. This part of the kit is advertised as a 3.5 inch lift, which is supposed to raise the front of the truck 3.5 inches over stock, and the rear about an inch and 3 quarters. Since we already have a leveling kit installed, this should only be adding an inch and a half or maybe 2 inches to our ride height, which means it shouldn't be obnoxiously tall. In fact, some of the heavy duty trucks roll out of the factory with a higher ride height than we'll probably end up with but that little extra bit of lift will hopefully help us clear 33 inch tires on our negative offset wheels, give a little bit of extra ground clearance, which would definitely be appreciated because there have been a few times where that's been an issue, and really just get the truck to look the way I would like it to. For a before comparison, we measured the tops of the fender wells to the ground at all four corners. The fronts are about 38 inches off the ground and the rears are about 39. We also kind of eyeballed the overall height of the truck, and at the front we were looking at 74 and a half inches at the GPS antenna on the cab, about 75 and a quarter at the light bars on the rear of the truck, and 81 and a half inches at the tallest point, which is the radio antenna. Before we got to installing this lift kit, there was something with the garage itself that I needed to take a look at. The open height of the garage door is about 82 and a half inches. There are also a few other things, like this steel bar that hangs down, that I was always kind of worried about. The height of that bar is 83 inches, and every time we have an SUV or truck up on jack stands in the garage, it's getting pretty close. 
For a little bit of extra peace of mind, we're going to modify the garage door for extra clearance. First, we're going to zip tie the emergency release handle just so it doesn't hang so low and always bump on the windshield. Then I'll just hold the angle grinder above my head and cut the excess length off of that adjustable bar. Then we can clean it up with a flap disc and give it a quick spray of paint just to make sure it doesn't rust. That modification was quick and easy and seems to have gotten us a little bit more than 2.5 inches of extra clearance. All of this measuring was so that we could make sure the truck would actually roll back out of the garage after the lift kit was installed. It seems like it might be a little close, but the truck shouldn't have any issues rolling in or out of the garage and we should be able to get it pretty high on jack stands for working under it. After that incredibly long preamble, we finally have the truck in the garage where we're planning to work on it. Before taking things apart though, we should become acquainted with the lift kit we're using. There are two different models of 3.5 lift kits that Rough Country makes for these trucks, one that replaces the entire steering knuckle, and this one which includes new upper control arms. This is also the basic version of the kit that doesn't use longer struts, but just reuses the factory ones with 3 inch spacers. It uses these nylon fiber spacers to drop the differential down an inch, and this steel skid plate protects the differential in its new position. The rear lift is accomplished by replacing the factory cast leaf spring blocks with these taller fabricated ones, and the kit includes longer rear shocks to go along with them. And that's the gist of what we'll be installing. The other half of the kit, which we might install in the future but we won't be installing today, is a pretty standard body lift. There are a bunch of these one and a quarter inch nylon fiber pucks, bumper relocation brackets, and hardware to go with it all. It's pretty much what you'd expect to see, and if we want a little bit more ride height out of this in the future, we already have this parts kit just sitting around. To install the suspension lift half of the kit, of course, we'll need to remove the wheels. The usual go-to is just impacting the lug nuts loose, but since we're using splined lug nuts, I'd like to avoid using the impact gun with that socket adapter. You could probably get away with it, at least for a while, but I've heard that these do tend to break with impact gun use. Anyway, with the truck still on the ground, we're just breaking loose the lug nuts on the front two wheels. Lifting the front of the truck is a more involved process, and that's where we're going to start. We'll roll the jack underneath and get the truck far enough off of the ground that we should be able to comfortably work on everything. We'll be supporting it underneath the frame rails with jack stands, and we'll carefully lower the truck down onto them. And we'll spin the lug nuts the rest of the way off. Once all 12 of them have been removed from the front wheels, we'll take those off. Then we'll get the splash guard out of the way. This one has seen better days, it's been bashed around and drift stitched back together and has a real Frankenstein's monster vibe. Somewhere down the line, I'd like to make or buy an actual skid plate for the underside of this thing to replace this broken plastic mess. But for now, we'll just be placing that plastic one aside. I'm sure we could have gotten away with not removing it, but it always seems to be in the way, so it's a good start. And we'll get to work disassembling the suspension and the steering systems. We're starting on the driver's side. The first thing we'll remove is the tie rod and nut. We'll be taking this side apart a little farther than you have to for just the lift kit because we're also replacing one of the CV axle boots. The outer driver's side boot had just recently torn and was starting to throw grease. We caught it soon enough that I'm sure the joint is okay and it just needs a new boot, so that's all we're going to be replacing. We'll also pop off this blue plastic ring that helps with the centering of the wheels. It shouldn't be too stuck, so we'll just use a hammer to separate the tie rod end from the steering knuckle. Wrapping on the steering knuckle and giving some gentle taps to the tie rod end ball stud knocked it loose pretty easily. And we'll just set that out of the way. Now we'll remove the wire for the wheel speed sensor and its little plastic clip from the upper control arm. This will give us more wiggle room to work, and since we're going to be replacing the upper control arms, we needed to do this sooner or later anyway. We'll also separate the clip from the bracket that's mounted at the top of the steering knuckle. Then we can remove the small bolt that's holding this bracket to the upper control arm. This bracket holds onto the wheel speed sensor wire and the brake hose. We'll thread that bolt back into the control arm just finger tight to help keep track of it. And to make sure we're not pulling on the speed sensor wire throughout this process, we'll also unclip it from the frame. Once the clip has been pulled loose, we'll separate the connector. Now we can let those wires just hang down out of the way. The next thing we'll do is disconnect the sway bar from the lower control arm. This is another thing that shouldn't be necessary just to install the lift kit, 
but with that disconnected, we'll be able to more easily move the lower control arm around to get the CV axle out as well as separate the lower ball joint so that we can replace the ball joint boots. Just like the CV axle boot, the lower ball joint boots are another thing we'll be replacing while we're here. After destroying the original driver side ball joint, we replaced them both with AC Delco parts back in 2016. Unfortunately, after less than three years, those boots were already dry rotting and falling apart. The joints themselves should be okay, so we will just be replacing the boots. To get to them, we'll need to separate that ball joint from the steering knuckle. We can't completely remove it before the CV axle is out of there, but we can at least start by doing the hard part, which is separating the taper of the ball joint stud from the steering knuckle. Once the cotter pin is out of the way, we'll loosen up the castle nut just enough so that it's flush with the end of the stud. Then we'll jack up from underneath the control arm and see if some light percussion engineering can help us out here. We can tap lightly on the stud, but we need to be careful not to distort its threads or the castle nut. But just like the tie rod, beating on the steering knuckle is our best bet. But unfortunately, just like the last time I had to fight these things, that just wasn't enough. And so, out comes the pickle fork. These are very good at separating ball joints, although almost always at the expense of the boot. But if it's going to be replaced anyway, that really isn't a concern. This particular fork I had modified the last time I had to do this job. The points of the tines are cut shorter, and we had cut this large washer into a horseshoe shape to act as a shim and effectively increase the thickness of the fork. Then we can jam the washer and the fork into that joint and hammer it in. With some hammering, you can see the end of the stud starting to lift, which means the taper has been broken and it has been effectively separated from the steering knuckle. This was much, much easier than the first time I had to do the job, although already having the right tool certainly helped. Next, we'll loosen up the lock nut that's holding in the upper ball joint. There's not a whole lot of room here, so unfortunately the impact isn't going to fit. But that's okay, we'll lubricate the threads and remove it with some manual wrenching. Just like the other joints, we'll leave the nut partway on and see if we can break the upper control arm loose from the steering knuckle. And there it goes. Luckily it came loose without much of a fight. We decided to just take off the entire steering knuckle to get it out of the way, and the next thing we need to take off to do that is the brake caliper. We'll take out the two slide pin bolts, remove the caliper, and hang it up off of the frame with a piece of wire. Then we'll slide out the brake pads and set them aside. It was a bit of hubris and mostly laziness to leave the brake rotor and the caliper bracket installed, and if I had to do it again, I would definitely take those two off. Partly because it's hard to hold onto the thing with the rotor wanting to turn, and mostly because it just makes the whole assembly real freaking heavy. But we decided to leave it together and we'll have to deal with that as we continue. The last thing we need to separate to remove the steering knuckle is the CV axle. To access the axle nut, we'll use a chisel and a large flat blade screwdriver to pop loose the dust cover. And with that out of the way, a large 36mm axle socket and an angry impact gun will take the nut right off. Then we'll shimmy the washer out of there and check to see if the axle is going to behave. Since we had previously replaced these hubs and greased the heck out of the splines, the CV axle is moving freely. The knuckle is ready to come off, so we'll finish removing the upper and lower ball joint nuts. The process of removing it from here is a little bit difficult, though it's mostly due to the aforementioned weight of the assembly. First we'll remove the nut from the upper control arm and pop the ball joint out of the knuckle. Then the knuckle can be pivoted downwards and the CV can be pulled inwards and separated from it. Then the whole thing will drop off of the lower ball joint and it's off of the vehicle. And now that we have clear, easy access to it, we can work on the CV axle. I had previously wrapped the torn part of the boot with electrical tape, which actually kinda sorta worked to keep the grease in. So we'll start by unraveling that. To get the clamp off, we'll just cut through with a Dremel and then separate it with a flathead screwdriver. With this type of pinch CV boot clamp, sometimes you can just squish that crimp and loosen them up, but these were real tough and it was easier just to use the Dremel to cut them and get them out of the way. And once we had both clamps off, we needed to slide the boot away from the joint. The boot was pretty stuck on, but once we pried it off we were able to slide it away. To get the old boot off, and certainly the new one on, we need to separate the joint from the axle shaft. After fiddling with it for a bit, I decided it would be easier just to remove the CV axle entirely from the vehicle. All that's left to make this happen are the six bolts holding the inner side of the CV to the differential flange. Since the knuckle was entirely out of the way, we were easily able to do this with the impact gun and an extension. 
Once the last bolt has been removed, the axle is free from the differential. With the strut still installed, it's a bit awkward, but we were able to push the sway bar up out of the way and slide it through that opening. You may wonder why the sway bar was so easy to move when we haven't unbolted it on the passenger side. Well, the right side end link had been broken for a while. The driver side one had previously been replaced, but I'm pretty sure the passenger side was original. Once we start working on the passenger side, we'll remove the broken end link. For now, we've got the CV axle on the floor, and it'll be a lot easier to work on it there than inside the wheel well of the truck. We were able to compare the replacement boot with the original, and we're sure it's correct, so we'll just go ahead and cut the old one off. Then we'll try to remove as much of the old grease as possible. One, because it's old. Two, because it's probably contaminated. And three, we need to be able to see the actual clip that holds the axle together. And a few paper towels later, there are the ends of it. We'll use the snap ring pliers to spread the clip open, and with just a little pull, the joint slides right off of the axle. Now we'll take a few minutes to use carb cleaner and paper towels to get everything as clean as we can. We want to make sure there's nothing left in there that could speed up the wear of the joint once the boot has been replaced. And once we feel okay about the cleanliness situation, we'll slide a new inner clamp over the shaft and apply some grease. Putting grease between the boot and the axle shaft isn't really necessary, but it'll make installing it a bit easier. We're using CV joint specific grease, which as anyone who has come in contact with this stuff before knows that it is in contention for the messiest substance in the known universe. And even before we reinstall the joint, we'll get started by glooping that onto the ball bearing elements. We'll spread it around and make sure everything is thoroughly soaked, and we'll slide on our new replacement boot, coat the inside with any grease that's left, and reinstall the axle joint to the shaft. With a bit of force, that retaining clip will seat back into its groove, and the outer joint will click back onto the shaft. We'll make sure it's not going to go anywhere, and then finish getting the boot into position. And we'll get the inner and outer clamps into place. The idea behind this kind of clamp is to get it as tight as possible by hand, or like in the case of this one, it was right on the edge between two notches and we used a pair of pliers to slide it one click farther down. And once the clamp is snug, we'll finish tightening it by using a special crimping tool. Or in this case, nail cutters, because they do the job pretty well too. Once we're sure the clamp is nice and tight, we'll do the same thing for the inner end of the boot. We'll make sure it's in position on the grooves in the shaft, snug down the clamp, and crimp it to fully tighten. We'll clean up any excess grease and work the joint around to make sure everything seems to be working properly. This should also help spread the grease around inside of the joint. While it's on the bench, this is also when a responsible and forward-thinking person would replace the inner CV axle boot. But since the others were still intact, at this point in time we only replaced the torn one. Outer boots will almost always wear out faster, but eventually the inner boot is going to do the same thing. At the time, money was tight and yada yada yada, at some point we'll have to replace the other boots too. But for now, today, this CV axle is done. So how about the ball joint boots? Clearly, these old ones are not doing very well at all. We'll be totally removing these old ones, which we can do by prying out the steel ring at the base of the ball stud. And once that has been unraveled, the whole thing comes right off. Just like the CV axle joint, we'll clean this up as best we can. There is no sign of water damage or wear on this ball joint, so we should be okay to just replace the boot and keep going. Unfortunately, finding a replacement boot was actually really difficult. I couldn't even find a GM part number, so they must just replace the lower ball joints as complete assemblies. I ended up on the Prothane website digitally digging through universal sized ball joint and tie rod end boots until I found this one. I still had one of the original ball joints from this truck sitting around, and from measuring it, this is the closest boot I could come up with. So fingers crossed, let's hope it fits. It fits perfectly at the base of the ball joint and seems to fit the stud very well. The only concern is that it's a little bit on the tall side. Hopefully that doesn't cause any issues, but we won't really know until everything is bolted back together. Other than just that they allow us to not replace the entire ball joint, the other upside to using these boots is that they're made of polyurethane. Hopefully these won't dry rot and fail in the same way as the old boots and they should put up with more abuse. Well, hopefully. Just for kicks, we'll push some new grease through the joint and work it all the way around to get out as much of the old grease as possible. 
Once it's wiped down again, we'll put the boot back into place to keep everything clean while we do the other work. The next thing we'll be doing is removing the strut from the vehicle. We'll access the upper fasteners through the engine bay, and once we lift this wiring loom clip off of one of them, we can impact off the other three. Just don't touch the center one, as that's the one retaining the spring. And once all the upper fasteners are out of the way, next we need to remove the lower bolts. The factory setup is a spring clip nut held to the shock and a bolt coming through from underneath. But with these leveling kit spacers, it's just a bolt and a nut holding the strut in. We'll spray down the rusty hardware, and once it's clear that these lock nuts aren't totally seized, we'll use the electric ratchet to spin them off. There's not a ton of it, but there is a little bit of tension here holding these bolts in place. So we need to knock these out, and also be careful where we put our fingers while doing so. Once we spin out the second bolt, we can give the strut a push, and the whole thing should come apart. We'll get the strut assembly off of the vehicle and onto the bench. I knew these were pretty rusty, and now getting a close look at it, it doesn't make me feel any better about them. There's some pretty deep rust on the body of the shock. Unfortunately, I didn't have replacement units ready to go, or the money to buy them. The best thing to do would probably be to go to Rough Country and buy their lifted strut assemblies, and not use the spacers at all. This would theoretically be better for increasing the length of suspension travel and not just the ride height. But they're also a bit expensive, at least for my kind of budget, and I have seen some negative reviews for them. So there's a decision that needs to be made there, but for today we're just going to be reusing these old rusty struts. To give them the best chance possible, we'll knock loose the scaly rust with a screwdriver, hit them with the wire brush, and give them a coating of rust converter. We've used a few different types of converters in the past with varying levels of success. This time we'll be using Corroseal as I've heard good things about it and it's fairly inexpensive. We'll see what it can do with fairly minimal prep to all this rust. Somewhere down the line we will be replacing these and we'll just have to see how it's held up by then. As this dries it will convert the top layer of rust and form a black colored protective barrier. And on top of that, we'll give it a few light coats of black spray paint. And while that dries, we'll get back to the truck and keep moving along. Next, we'll be removing the upper control arms. The upper control arms on this truck are camber adjustable, but they come preset from the factory with this bit of plastic to hold them in alignment. The cool thing about that is that it means the control arm can be removed, and then the bolts will only go back in in the same orientation. That saves us from having to mark the hardware and rotate it to a specific point. If the camber did need to be adjusted, that plastic piece can be removed and a custom position can be set. Since this lift is still relatively minor, there's a chance that the stock camber adjustment won't be too bad. So unless things go south later, we'll be keeping the plastic tabs in place so that we'll keep the factory setting. Starting with the rear bolt, we'll break it loose and then spin it all the way off with the ratchet. Then, once the bolt has been freed, we'll move to the front and repeat the same process. We'll use a punch and do a bit of wiggling to get those bolts out of the frame. And with those out of the way, the control arm can be finangled loose. With the factory upper control arm removed, the driver's side disassembly is finished and it's ready for new parts. But we're still letting the paint on the strut dry, so before putting everything back together, let's roll underneath the truck and get to work on something else. To get the ride height we're looking for, but keep the CV axles from wearing out too quickly, we need to lower the differential a little bit so that the angles aren't as dramatic as they would be. As mentioned earlier, we'll be using those nylon fiber spacers included with the lift kit to do this. The problem is, there's not quite enough space built into the vehicle to do that without making modifications. The first thing we'll be doing is removing this crossmember to notch it for clearance. There are four bolts and four nuts that hold this in, two on each side of the frame. We'll hold the head of each bolt with a wrench and use the impact gun to remove the four nuts. Then we'll tappy tap each of the four bolts to free them, and we'll pull them out one at a time until it's just road crust and friction holding the crossmember in. We'll have to give that a bit of a pry to get it loose. Then we can pull the crossmember totally off of the vehicle. This next part is a bit tricky and requires a certain amount of care. We need to trim these two fins on the side of the differential case. They're already relatively close to the frame, and if we lower this thing anymore they will definitely run into it. 
If you took the entire differential off the vehicle, you could grind these down and make them look real nice, but I decided to just lay on my back with the sawzall and hack pieces off until it looked like it was going to clear. As long as you're mindful of where that blade is going and what exactly it's cutting, there's not really any danger to cutting these fins off. So I kind of just eyeballed it and went for it and spent some time hacking away. Unfortunately, I couldn't get a good camera angle on this or even see it very well while it was cutting, so it's a guess and check kind of situation. If you were to do this, I would suggest to not screw around with it and just cut the entire fin off or as much of it as possible on the first pass. If it was really close to clearing and you just had to take a little bit more off, it would be pretty difficult to do that with the Sawzall. Those fins are just cast aluminum and they don't open into the body or anything, so there's nothing to worry about there. After a few minutes of careful cutting, here are the pieces that I loosed from the housing. This is pretty much what the finished product looks like. We rounded over the sharp edges with sandpaper, but that's really all the material that we removed. Here's a before and after so you can see the difference in clearance. We'll just have to hope and wait and see if it's actually enough room. Now that that's been trimmed, we can install the differential spacers. There are four mounts going to the frame that are isolated by rubber bushings just like this one. Each of those bolts will need to be removed, the differential dropped down, a spacer installed, and a longer bolt dropped into place. Before removing anything, we'll put the floor jack under the diff to support it. Then we'll need to use a wrench to hold the bolt from the top while we use an impact gun from underneath to remove the nut. It's a bit tricky to get a wrench in place to hold some of these bolt heads, but we managed to get it done. We do need to remove and replace these factory bolts since they're not long enough to use with the spacers. Now that we have the two on the driver side removed, we'll repeat the same process for the two on the passenger side. The front differentials in these trucks bolt to a sort of cradle and that's what we're removing the bolts from. There are bolts holding the diff to the cradle, but that's not what we're removing. The spacers that we'll be installing go between the cradle arms and the frame of the truck. And as soon as that fourth fastener is loosened, we can see the whole thing separate from the frame. We'll finish the task of getting out the four bolts, and we'll lower the floor jack just a little bit so that we can install the spacers. These are a bit awkward to get on there with most things still assembled, so a bit of automotive yoga is definitely required. But we were able to get the spacer in place, and we dropped through the longer bolt that came with the kit. It's been a long time coming, but that is actually the first piece of this lift kit we have installed onto the vehicle. The bolt has one washer under its head, and we'll be using another washer between the bottom surface and the nut. To make sure things don't get stuck in place, we'll be adding a bit of anti-seize to the threads. Then we'll just loosely install the nut onto the bolt so that we still have enough wiggle room to repeat that same process and get the other bolts and spacers installed. When trying to pull the diff down enough to get the spacers installed on the passenger side, the CV axle shaft was actually hitting the strut bolt. I'm guessing this is why the new spacers are on top of the strut and not below it. So we went ahead and removed the rearmost bolt to get it out of the way. Then we had enough room to get the other two spacers on top of the cradle. Pretty soon, we had all four in place and we started to tighten them down. Only when I was tightening them, things didn't feel quite right, and when I took a closer look, the problem was immediately obvious. I was using the washers that came with the lift kit, and obviously they weren't too happy with the torque spec. In fact, they had completely deformed before even getting close to it. Which makes me wonder a bit about the quality of the other hardware. There appeared to be some amount of hardening in these washers, but they were definitely too thin and probably not quite hard enough either. Here's one of those bent up included washers next to some actual grade 8 USS ones that we replaced them with. And if that wasn't bad enough, here are the split lock washers that also came with the kit. These were definitely not up to grade 8 torque. I tested the bolts with a torque wrench and they seemed totally fine, but I decided to replace all of the other supporting hardware since I just couldn't trust it. It's pretty disappointing since everything else in this kit seems put together really well, but it just goes to show that you can't ever take anything for granted. And for extremely important hardware like suspension components, you don't want to screw around. So we ended up using the included bolts, but replaced the washers and the nuts. With the hardware upgraded, we were finally able to torque the four differential cradle hold-down bolts to 50 foot-pounds. And with everything bolted down, we could check our clearances. Uh, well, 
it could be a little better, but they're not actually touching. It's a little hard to make it out in the video, but I could just about slip a piece of paper between the two parts. This is kind of what I mentioned earlier about trying to cut off as much of the fin as deep as possible on the first try. Without removing everything from the vehicle, it would be difficult to remove any more material, so I decided to just leave it as is. There shouldn't be much movement in that front differential, and even if it did move a little bit and contacted the frame here, I don't imagine it making any trouble. So we'll call that good enough and proceed to the next clearance problem. Here's that frame cross member that we removed earlier that still needs to be notched. This needs to be able to clear the now lowered rear edge of the differential housing. But before doing any cutting, we figured it was worth trying to clean this cross member out. It had somehow gotten packed with dirt and rocks, and we figured that wasn't ideal. It just so happened that Sean was pressure washing his Volvo at the same time, so we let him have at it. Not only did it clean up the outside of the cross member, but it knocked loose a lot of things on the inside. Now that it was looking much better, it was time for its appointment with the angle grinder. The cut we're going to be making came right out of the install manual for our lift kit. Rough Country also has a detailed video on the process, although it's a little bit outdated and the kit that I received is a bit different from the one they used in the video. But I can't complain too much because their video definitely has more people who know what they're doing in it than this one does. We used Sharpie to mark out the cut in the cross member based on dimensions given in the instructions. Of course, we also did a test fit to make sure I was cutting the right side before going at it with the angle grinder. Pretty soon, we had cut all around it, and the hammer will knock out our nice little viewing window. It wouldn't be a bad idea to weld in a piece of angle iron or something to add back in the strength to this cross member, but given that this is a full frame truck and most of the strength is still in this one and there are a couple of other cross members, I'm not too concerned about that. If you are making a desert racer, plate that in, but on our truck I don't think it's gonna matter. We gave the cut area of the cross member a quick coat of paint and it was time to reinstall it. We'll just use the dead blow hammer to smack it back into position. We'll make sure to get all four of the bolts installed, then we'll start tightening them down. Once they're all snug, we'll go back around and torque each of them to 75 foot-pounds. For now, we're done working underneath the truck, and we'll get back to the bench where we're working on the strut assembly. Specifically, this is the lift spacer that will be installed to the top of the strut. But before we can do that, we need to install three studs into it. These were included with the kit, and they just seem to be regular old wheel lug studs, so they should be pretty sturdy. Because of the thick paint on the spacer, we'll need to use a hammer and a punch to get these studs into place. Then once they're partway there, we'll finish installing them the same way we would a lug stud for a wheel. The studs have a splined section at the bottom that'll prevent them from rotating, and we need to pull that splined section all the way up into the steel of the spacer. To do that, we'll just use a stack of washers, a nut, and the impact gun to pull them tight. And once the shoulder of each stud is flush with the underside surface on the spacer, it is fully installed. And once we've repeated that process two more times, this spacer is fully assembled. But of course there are two of these spacers, so while we're here and everything is set up, we'll finish installing the studs onto the other spacer as well. And just like that, both of the spacers are ready to go. And go they shall, right on top of the strut. The trick here is that all three of the studs in the strut itself are so long that the nuts have to be installed before the spacer can be slid all the way on. And once each of those is started, the laborious process of tightening down each of those three lock nuts can begin. To help hold the strut still, we'll slide a breaker bar through the open end of the spacer, and unfortunately we didn't have a way to put a torque wrench on here, so we'll just have to get it as tight as we can with the open end of a wrench. We tighten them in a circular pattern to make sure the spacer was pulled down flush with the strut and that everything was tightened evenly. With that done, the strut is ready to be reinstalled. We'll go ahead and clean up any remaining CV axle grease that had gotten slung around, then hold the control arm down and lift the strut up to get it into position. With the upper studs lined up with their holes in the frame, we'll also drop in two lower bolts just to keep the strut from moving while we tighten the uppers down. We'll get each of the three nuts started on their threads and then tighten them down once again through the engine bay. We'll use a stack of extensions to get them snug down with a ratchet, then we'll switch to the torque wrench and tighten the three nuts down to 40 foot-pounds. And we'll put the clip for the wiring loom back over one of them. 
Now that the top has been secured, we'll take the bottom two bolts back out and get them secured correctly. The kit includes new hardware for the lower side of the strut, presumably because the factory ones would be too long and just like we noticed earlier, hit the CV axle. We'll use a pry bar and a screwdriver to get the strut lined up correctly with the lower control arm and slide the two bolts through. The instructions with the kit didn't mention anything about it, so I didn't think too much of it at the time, but I feel like it would be a good idea to loosen the lower control arm mounting bolts at this point. If you loosen them now and get the bushings moving inside the frame freely, you could retighten the bolts with the vehicle at the new ride height. That would keep the bushings in a more neutral position which should prolong their life. But maybe the extra few degrees here isn't so dramatic it would make a difference and that's why the instructions don't say anything about it. Either way, we didn't end up loosening the lower control arm bolts and we just pried it into place to get it where we needed it to be. Once we had both of the lower strut bolts installed, we alternated front to back until we had both of them torqued down to 37 foot-pounds. So the strut has been extended and fully installed, next up is the upper control arm. This is the steel control arm that came with the kit, which should keep the upper ball joint at a better angle for the new ride height. We'll slot it into the frame and use a dead blow to tap it into place. We've applied some anti-seize to the original hardware and we'll slot it through the new control arm. It's a little bit awkward with the strut already in place, and we probably should have done this before installing it. But there is just enough room to get the bolts all the way installed. Once the flats on the bolts are aligned with the outer camber adjustment plates, everything should just slide together. And we'll reinstall the nuts and snug them down. We won't be fully tightening these until later, since we want the suspension to be at ride height before torquing them down. The ball joint installed on this control arm does have a grease fitting, and it's underneath this plastic cap. We'll go ahead and pop that cap off so that we're ready to grease it once the knuckle is installed. And we're getting ready to do that, but while the access is still good, we'll reinstall the CV axle. With the spacer on the strut and the sway bar still out of the way, this time there's plenty of room to easily guide it through all of the suspension components. We'll reinstall all six of the bolts finger tight, snug them down in a crisscross pattern, and torque them each to 58 foot-pounds. We jammed a pry bar between the axle flange and the differential housing to help keep everything from spinning. And with the CV reattached, the knuckle is ready to be reinstalled. We'll put a small bungee cord on the upper control arm to help keep it out of the way while we get the lower ball joint in place. And we'll regrease the CV axle splines. Now we just have to heft everything back into place. First, the knuckle goes over the lower ball joint and a nut is loosely installed to hold it in. Then we'll tilt everything just so to reinstall the axle and line the splines up so that we can fully install it. Then we can drop the upper control arm back down and slide it into place too. Unfortunately, we had some trouble getting the ball joint through far enough to thread on a nut. We'll reinstall the axle washer and nut to keep it in place in the hub and roll the floor jack underneath the control arm. Through the combination of lifting up on the lower control arm and pushing down on the upper control arm, we were able to get the nut threaded onto that stud. And now we'll start tightening down the ball joint hardware. Once the studs are about flush with the ends of the nuts, we can safely remove the floor jack. We'll finish torquing the ball joints by torquing the lower castle nut to 92 foot-pounds and tightening the upper as best we can. The spec for the upper is 37 foot-pounds, but we can't really get a torque wrench in there, so we'll just get it nice and tight. The lower ball joint uses a castle nut, and in just a minute we'll install a cotter pin to hold that in place. Unfortunately, it does seem like the ball joint boots are a little bit too long. With the stud bolted down, they have gotten a bit squished. It isn't the best looking, but polyurethane is pretty tough stuff, so we'll just have to wait and see how this holds up. Now that the ball joints are fully in place, we can reinstall the wire for the speed sensor. We'll clip it back into the knuckle, then install the brake hose and speed sensor bracket to the upper control arm with the original hardware. The new upper arms were already drilled and tapped for this bracket, so it went on easy. Next, we'll use a grease gun to lubricate the upper and lower ball joints. For the upper, we'll add grease until the boot starts to swell just the tiniest bit, but for the lower, I'm not even sure the polyurethane boot would do that or it wouldn't be obvious about it, so we'll just make a guess on how much grease to add and call it good. We'll clean the excess grease off the fittings and tap the plastic cover back into the upper control arm. We'll also go ahead and use the impact gun to snug down the axle nut. We'll fully tighten this later once we can put a wheel on and lower the vehicle to the ground. 
Next, we'll install the lower ball joint cotter pin, and to help us tighten the nut a little bit farther to do that, we'll install the outer tie rod end. For now, we'll just drop it into place and thread on the nut to help keep the knuckle from rotating. We'll use a breaker bar to turn the castle nut just a little bit farther until the notches line up and we can slide a cotter pin through. And with that secured, now we'll go back and torque down the tie rod end to 44 foot-pounds. This side is nearing completion, so the next thing we have to do is spray down the brake rotor with brake clean, grease and reinstall the brake pads and hardware, and finally reinstall the brake caliper. We'll apply some anti-seize and reinstall the two slide pin bolts, then torque them both down to 74 foot-pounds. We'll also reattach and secure the connector for the wheel speed sensor. The last things we need to tighten down now are the upper control arm bolts. The most ideal way to do this would be with the wheel on and the vehicle on the ground, and since this is a truck, it would probably be possible. But that doesn't mean it wouldn't be kind of annoying. So in order to do this with the wheel off, we rolled the floor jack underneath the control arm once again and lifted it up. But this time, we lifted until that corner of the frame was just off of the jack stand. This means that all of the vehicle's weight in this corner is being supported by the spring, so it should be at or very close to ride height position. And that's good enough for us, so we'll torque down the bolts for the upper control arm in this position. We'll hold the bolt heads with a wrench just to make double sure that they don't go anywhere, and we'll torque the nuts down to 140 foot-pounds. Then we'll let it down off the jack, and we're pretty much done with this corner. The only things left are torquing the axle nut and reattaching the sway bar, which we'll do later. And by later, I mean another time since I didn't actually know the right side was broken and I don't have the hardware to replace it. So for a little while it won't have a front sway bar connected, although it didn't before, anyway, and under everyday driving conditions it didn't seem to make too big of a difference. I'm not saying anyone should do this, it's just how things worked out. Since the driver's side is back together, that means it's time to do all of that over again on the passenger side. The process for this side is going to be very similar. One main difference is that we won't be fully removing the CV axle since the boots are still intact. Since both lower ball joint boots were bad, we'll be replacing both, which means we'll still be fully disconnecting the knuckle from the vehicle. For time and patience reasons, we'll be speeding through this side much more than the other side, so let's get right to work. Off comes the hub centering ring, the wheel speed sensor wire and brake hose bracket, hub dust cover, the axle nut and its washer, the outer tie rod end nut and the tie rod from the steering knuckle, the cotter pin for the lower ball joint, the lower ball joint nut, the lower ball joint stud from the steering knuckle, the brake caliper slide pin bolts, the caliper itself, and the brake pads. Then we'll remove the upper ball joint nut, separate it from the steering knuckle, and pull the whole steering knuckle assembly off of the vehicle. Then off comes the busted lower ball joint boot, the joint is cleaned up, a polyurethane boot is installed, and the CV axle splines are greased. I knew I would need help to get the steering knuckle reinstalled, but it was late and the last of my friends had to leave, so we decided to get that installed right away. So we finangled that back onto the vehicle, and we'll just let it hang there while we do the rest of the work. To continue with this assembly, we'll remove the remaining lower strut bolt, which will separate it from the control arm, and to keep that from drooping too badly, we'll use the floor jack to hold it up. Next, we'll remove the three nuts for the upper side of the strut, and slide out the strut itself. There was a bit more stuff in the way this time, but it was easy enough to drop it straight through the bottom of the control arm and pull it out that way. This strut was rusted even worse than the driver's side one. In fact, if it was on anything but my personal vehicle, I probably wouldn't let it leave the garage like this. Because of the suspension setup on this vehicle, a strut failure shouldn't be catastrophic, but as the rust continues and it starts to lose oil, it's going to have a harder and harder time doing its job, and if you don't know what's going on, it could definitely get dangerous. For the time being, this strut is just going to get the same rust treatment as the other side, the only difference being we didn't have enough time to let it fully dry or paint it, so it'll just be the converter holding everything together. But we'll let that sit for as long as possible, so we'll get back to the truck and start removing the upper control arm. We'll remove both of the bolts, and pry the arm itself away from the frame. And now that there's plenty of room, we'll try to remove that broken tie rod link. As you can see, it's rusted pretty solid, and the impact alone isn't going to be quite enough. But with a large set of vice grips clamped onto the remainder of the bolts, we can hold it still and remove the nut. Then it'll take just a bit of hammering to knock the whole thing out of the sway bar. 
So we have the passenger side ready to put back together, but to give the strut as long as possible to dry, there's another job we can take care of. And that's rolling underneath and mounting the new mini skid plate for the front differential. This is to make sure that the now lower than the frame differential doesn't bump into anything. It's a pretty heavy piece of steel, though it's only secured with two bolts. The holes to mount it already exist, but they're going to need a little bit of work. We decided that the best thing to do here was to drill the holes out a little bit larger and tap them for new threads. The steel isn't terribly thick, so the only objective is to keep the tap as straight as possible when cutting into it. Then once we have two clean 7 16 by 14 threaded holes, we'll hold up the skid plate, thread in two bolts, and snug those down. We decided to just tighten these down by feel since the steel they're threaded into isn't terribly thick. With those tight, the skid plate shouldn't be going anywhere. And while we're under here, we'll go ahead and reinstall our beat up splash guard. We'll get each of the four bolts threaded in, and then tightened down. So that's the underside of the front of the truck done, and we'd killed about as much time as I could afford to, so it was time to reinstall the strut. With it on the bench, we already installed the lift kit's strut spacer, so all we have to do is slot it into place. Once the upper studs are lined up, we can raise the floor jack to keep the strut loosely in place while we install the lower and upper fasteners. And once those are loosely installed, we'll torque down the top of the strut, followed by the bottom. Then we'll grab the new passenger side control arm and tap it into place. The bolts are reinstalled and snugged down. Then we'll get the upper ball joint stud reinstalled into the steering knuckle, thread on a nut to hold it in place, install the CV axle washer and nut, slot the tie rod into the knuckle and hold it in place, get the upper ball joint tightened down, and the lower ball joint torqued to spec. And once a cotter pin is installed, we'll also torque the outer tie rod end. We'll hit the axle nut with the impact gun to get it snugged down, reattach the brake hose bracket and the speed sensor wire, and fill the upper and lower ball joints with grease. Then we'll jack up from under the lower control arm and torque down the upper control arm hardware. We'll clean and re-grease the brakes, install the pads, and then the caliper. And we'll torque the slide pin bolts. And once the wheel speed sensor connector is attached and made extra secure with a zip tie, we are pretty much finished. Since, as we mentioned before, it's going to be going without a front sway bar for a while, the next thing to do is reinstall the front wheels. So we'll pop back on the hub centering rings and throw those on. We'll get all of the lug nuts snugged down, remove the hub center caps so that we can torque the axle nuts, and once again roll the floor jack under the truck to lift it up off of the jack stands, and we can finally set the front end back on the ground. Immediately, the stance is looking really strong. The suspension should settle down a bit, but it's obviously sitting higher than it was. To finish up the front end, we need to torque down the axle nuts to 177 foot-pounds. And of course, the lug nuts also need to be torqued down. We'll tighten them to 140 foot-pounds. And we can reinstall the dust cap, fully seating it in the hub by going around the outside edge with the hammer and screwdriver. Then we'll use a little bit of Loctite to reinstall the three bolts that hold in the wheel center caps. With those tightened down, we'll repeat the same processes for the passenger side, and finally, the lift kit is fully installed. Well, the, the front of it is. We're not in the Carolinas, so we do have to lift the back of the truck too. And of course, the truck was needed in the morning, so I guess we're pulling an all-nighter. Let's flip the truck around in the garage, and we'll get to work on the other half. The truck doesn't have a problem clearing the top of the garage door opening, so it appears that our measurements were correct. Lifting the back of the truck is much more simple, and it should be a lot easier. You can add leaf spring leaves to packs to get more lift, or just get a pre-made spring pack that is specifically designed to lift the vehicle. A heavier duty spring pack will probably raise the ride height a bit, but it'll also be a harsh ride without weight in the back of the truck. We're just gonna go with the simple steel spacers that came with the lift kit. Much like the front, it won't really increase the suspension travel, but it is a cheap and easy way to increase the ride height. And to get started, we'll jack up from under the rear axle and get the truck off of the ground. We're going to need all the height we can get here, since the suspension will fully droop once we lower the jack, and we're going to be adding even more height to the rear on top of that. This seems like a good height, and we've got our jack stand set up under the frame, so we're ready to get started, and the first thing we'll do is remove the rear shocks. 
These are pretty accessible and about as easy as they get. We'll start by removing the bottom bolt, holding the nut with a breaker bar, and spinning out the bolt with the impact gun. There doesn't seem to be any load on the bolt, and we can easily remove it. We'll do the same thing on the passenger side, removing that shock's lower bolt. Next up are the upper bolts, which are a bit more awkward to get to, but a swivel adapter lets the impact gun get in there. The top side uses weld nuts so we don't have to hold the other end. I have also donned the face shield for reasons that will be obvious in just a moment. The truck is hesitant to let go of these shocks, and it's letting me know by raining down all of the dirt it's collected. Once that bolt has been loosened, we can remove it and then wiggle loose the shock. And we'll repeat the same process to fully remove the shock on the passenger side. Next up are the leaf spring U-bolts. We have the jack back under the axle to safely support it while we remove the leaf spring hardware. We've already sprayed these with oil to give us a good shot since they'll be pretty tight. But luckily the impact gun just keeps on doing its job. We'll loosen these bit by bit in a crisscross pattern. Once they're all loose, we'll start removing them, and you can see that the axle is starting to droop down. Unfortunately, it also continues to fight back using its dirt shower defense mechanism. But once everything is off, we're able to knock loose and remove the U-bolt plate. Then we can lift each of the U-bolts up and off of the leaf spring, and move to the other side to do the same thing. We'll loosen up the four driver side U-bolt nuts in the same way, except on this side we won't be fully removing all of them. We'll remove two of the nuts, but leave two in place. We don't want to fully separate the axle on this side and risk dropping it off of the jack, but we need to loosen things up enough so that on the other side we can remove the factory block and install our aftermarket one. Now that the axle is loose, but still attached on this side, we'll move back to the passenger side. When we lower the jack a little bit, the axle will drop down and the leaf spring will stay put. We'll get in there with the pry bar to remove the rusted on factory cast block and we'll try to clean up those mounting surfaces just a little bit before installing the aftermarket one. And speaking of, here's the Rough Country welded steel one that came with the lift kit. The block is shaped like a wedge, and the thinner section faces forward. It has a nub on the bottom which indexes with the axle, and a hole in the top that indexes with the leaf spring center bolt. We'll get it in place on the axle, and then drop the new U-bolts over the leaf spring. These bolts from the lift kit are just a bit longer to make sure there's enough thread engagement with the taller lift block. Also, whenever possible, it's generally a good idea not to reuse axle U-bolts. That's probably not something you want to screw around with when they're the only thing holding on your rear axle. Despite some of the earlier experiences with the hardware in this kit, these U-bolts and their included lock nuts seem to be strong and well made. We'll get all of those finger tight to hold up the factory leaf spring plate. Now everything is loosely held in position, but we need to lift the axle up and index it with the leaf spring so that we can actually tighten it down. We'll carefully raise the jack bit by bit and move the axle around until the center bolt of the leaf spring slots into the hole at the top of the block. The axle was still sitting at a bit of an angle, so we tightened up the U-bolts to pull everything together. These leaves have a U-bolt guide plate on top of them that the bolts need to be sitting in. As we tighten things up, we'll make sure the center bolt stays where it needs to be and that the U-bolts are staying in their guide. We'll tighten these just enough to hold everything in place so that the lift block can't move around. Once that looks good, we can lower the jack down a little bit and we'll repeat this same process on the driver's side. We'll finish removing the U-bolt nuts, Pop off the U-bolt plate, remove the factory U-bolts, fry loose the factory block, slide on the new U-bolts, drop on the steel lift block, install the U-bolt bottom plate and hardware, and go through the same process of raising the jack, wiggling the axle, and tightening down the U-bolts to get everything in place. Once they're snug and everything is where it needs to be, the only thing left to do with the lift blocks is to torque down the U-bolts. This is a little bit contentious, and in reality it probably doesn't matter, but we're going to wait to torque these down until the truck is back on the ground. So for now, we'll leave it as is and get to installing the new lift shocks. These rough country shocks that come with the kit are a little bit taller than the factory units, which prevents them from being overextended and hitting their end of travel, which would give a really harsh ride. We'll get the lower bolt in place, cut the shipping wire, and install the upper bolt finger tight. Then we'll do the same thing on the passenger side. We'll get the top end of the shock approximately where it needs to be, then drop in the bottom bolt. 
With that in place, we'll move things around until we can install the top bolt too. Once all the hardware is reinstalled, we can once again lower the floor jack. Then we'll get the bolts tightened down. These should also be tightened down at ride height, although here I didn't. I think mostly because I was very tired at this point and just trying to get it over with. These don't see a whole lot of rotation, so I'm not too worried about the rubber bushings wearing out. We'll torque the lower and upper bolts to 85 foot-pounds. Then we'll go back to the driver's side to snug down and then torque down the shock bolts there. And at this point we are very, very close to finished. We'll once again use the floor jack under the differential to raise the rear of the truck. Then we can remove the jack stands from under the frame and drop it back to the ground. We'll give it a bit of a bounce to help it settle, but the ride height is looking pretty nice. It's definitely taller, but still quite usable and not obnoxiously high. It does sit a lot more like a heavy duty truck, but without the harsher ride quality. Or, you know, the towing and hauling capabilities, but in most cases this truck does get the job done. We'll go ahead and park it outside, and yes, it still does clear the garage door, mostly just to get some fresh air and get out of the garage we've been in for, at this point, 19 hours. Yep, that's how long this lift kit install took. The Rough Country website says this is a 5-6 to six hour install, and for someone who actually knows what they're doing, I'm sure that could be the case. This really is, at least as far as lift kits go, a simple install. We certainly spent some of that time screwing around and doing other work on the truck and the Volvo that day, and as anyone else who makes videos can attest, filming makes everything take much, much longer. But we managed to get the job done overnight. Well, we're almost done. We still have to roll back underneath and torque down the U-bolts. So we'll get back to work and torque down those eight nuts in a crisscross pattern to 74 foot-pounds. We want to make sure the forces on all four corners of that U-bolt plate, and therefore the axle, are as even as possible. After driving it a bit, it's a good idea to retorque as many of these suspension components as you can get to, but I would especially recommend retorquing these after a few hundred miles. Finally, after all that work, the lift kit install is done. We did check and had to change the toe setting on the tires, but we were able to do that with just a tape measure and the camber and caster are still entirely within spec. This is how the truck sits with the 3.5 inch lift kit installed. I like that it's still mostly flat, although it could have a bit more height in the back. This truck has been overloaded and abused and the factory leaf springs are pretty tired. But even without replacing them, I think the lift kit made a big improvement to, at least, the aesthetics of the vehicle. And what about the tire rubbing? That was one of the big excuses I had for why I should install this. Well, if you have four people in the truck and some cargo in the bed, they do still rub. But you only hear it when in reverse and turning sharply, and it's much, much less severe than before. So there's still a chance we will end up installing the body lift portion of this kit in the future. After our marathon session of wrenching to get everything together, the truck was able to make it where it needed to go. And I'm glad it did, but even more glad were the horses. It was perfectly happy picking up 20 bales of hay as it had before and it would do many more times. The height of the truck isn't at all unreasonable, and in fact sits a lot like a factory Z71. Now it was tall enough that the girlfriend made me reinstall the side steps that I had previously removed. Those are pretty easy to install, and we'll start by removing the body mount bolts that they attach to. If the body mount bolts haven't been loosened before, it's a good idea to do it with hand tools. That could help prevent breaking the nut that's welded inside of the body if things are really stuck. The rest of the installation is simply a matter of holding the bar up and tightening down those bolts back through it. We'll torque the mounting bolts to 50 foot-pounds and call it a day. Now everyone is happy again, and the ride of the truck is still very good. Since installing that kit and filming this video, the truck has had 9,000 miles put on it. In that time, there have been some problems and repairs and parts changed out, but none of them have had to do with the lift kit itself. Other than those problematic washers, I don't really have anything bad to say about the kit. I'm totally satisfied with the purchase, it was a good price, and I liked the results. Other than a concerningly low parking garage ceiling or two, it hasn't caused any trouble. Somewhat surprisingly, even those lower ball joint boots are still intact and appear to be sealing just fine.
but what about some actual numbers for the change in ride height? Unfortunately, I don't think I ever measured it on actual flat ground, so the numbers might be a little bit off, but measuring from the ground to the tops of the fenders with no load in the truck and the leveling kit installed, the front was about 38 inches off of the ground and the rear 39. After installing the lift kit, the measurement was about 40 inches in the front and 40 inches in the back. So it lifted the rear about 1 inch and the front around 2. If it didn't already have the leveling kit in the front, that probably would have worked out to 3.5 inches over stock height. The rear isn't sitting quite as high as it should, and again I think that's because of the clapped out factory springs. But something tells me we will take care of that down the line. Putting together this video, in the planning, the labor, the filming, the voiceover recording and editing has been an incredible feat. If you've made it all the way to this point, I really have to say thank you for watching, you brave soul. I hope this has been interesting, or informative, or maybe a little bit instructional, or at least that your pet is happy with the quality of the video that you left running while you left the house. If we've managed to keep one lonely dog comfortable for an hour, it was all worth it.